I love his preaching style. Um, it's, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, he's been like a dad to us basically since the beginning. Yeah, the way he breathes life and, and presents scripture in a new way um, has just been so impacting for, for me and I think for everybody involved. Yeah, and he's worked pretty hard to make a discipleship culture here and that's been kind of my favorite thing. Yeah, and the fact that he's led Brentwood Baptist for over 25 years has just been phenomenal. Hey, thing, uh, we're talking about Chris Brooks, not Mike Glenn. Oh. Oh, Chris Brooks. He's nice. Yeah, um, I like his beard. They have the same pants. I saw that once. He's young. You know, when you've been at a church for 25 years, as I have, you face some difficult choices, some hard transitions. And honestly, one of the hardest transitions for me was the time that I realized it was time for me to move on from Kairos. I love those kids, and more than Kairos will ever know, they've impacted my life more than I could ever tell them, and certainly more than I could ever express my gratitude for. So you can imagine how difficult it was for me to hand that ministry over to someone else. Chris Brooks has made that transition a very, very easy one for me. Chris has come and taken the Kairos ministry to levels that I knew it could go to, but I didn't know how to get them there. Chris did. Chris loves those kids. He teaches them well. He's been a great addition to our staff and a great friend to me. I'm glad you'll have the opportunity today to hear Chris Brooks. What a privilege it is to be honored and insulted in your introduction. So we're off to a great start. Uh, I'm Chris Brooks. I'm the Kairos pastor. And on behalf of the Kairos congregation that meets on Tuesday nights, we want to say thank you. Thank you for letting us be a part of this extended family. Whether that's during the week in service projects, Friday we were at the Tennessee Baptist Children's Home serving. This Monday we were at Young Life Capernaum, uh, being a friendly face uh, to all of our friends there, or whether it's in our midweek Bible reading groups where we get to equip and train and release people to make disciples that make disciples. Or if it's on Tuesday night where we've created an honest and unique place for people to connect to God and to connect to each other. And a lot of times we get people who feel marginalized and paralyzed in their faith walk people who are skeptical and suspicious of religious institutions, um, and young adults who have found themselves in a season where they feel bruised and broken. And I'm honored to be a representative of this place to pray and minister on your behalf. Uh, this last Tuesday afterwards, I got to pray for a young lady who came forward and asked for healing prayer, and she started to tell us a little bit about her story uh, she found out that she was pregnant three months into the pregnancy, lost the child, and in the process realized she has terminal cancer, was now struggling with alcoholism, depression, and hopelessness. And we got to be the hands and feet of Jesus for someone who thought Jesus just wasn't for them. And we got to pray over her and be a healing reminder that the love of God has for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so when you give, you give us those opportunities to have more moments like that. So I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward and receive our offerings. If you're in the overflow service, there should be baskets there as well. Would you pray for me? Or pray for me. That's good. You need to pray for me as well. <laughs> I say that so much when I say I'm going to pray for you. It's actually different. So <laughs> let me pray for our offering. Lord of the harvest. We want to say thank you for harvesting us, and thank you that the harvest is plentiful and bountiful. Thank you for the workers that you sent to us, and now would you send us as workers. And right here, right now, we acknowledge that we have freely received your mission and your message, your love, your grace, and your mercy, so now we will give back as an act of worship, obedience, and gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen.
So a while back, I was discipling and mentoring a young man in ministry, and he was in seminary at the time. And so when he would come back from seminary classes, I'd always pick his brain. Hey, what did you learn? Uh, part of that is because I probably didn't learn all I should have the first time around. The other part of that is, hey, how can I coach you and help you think about different things or piece some things together? One day he came back to the office and I said, hey man, anything you learned interesting today at school? And he said, I'm still trying to get over a simple and searing question that one of our professors asked us. And I'm like, ooh, do tell, do tell. And he said, he asked us this, if God answered every prayer this last month that you have prayed, how many people would be saved because of your prayer life? Now I have to admit to you, a pet peeve of mine is when I ask questions and someone says, huh? Or what did you say? When they obviously know good and well what you just said, they're just stalling for more time to respond. My kids are masters at this. Hey, did you clean your room up like I asked you? Huh? What'd you say? Sweetheart, this is the fourth time I've asked you to not bring your device to the table. Huh? What'd you say? I'll give you one guess what my response was to that question. Huh? What did you say? He said he asked us, if God answered every prayer that you have prayed this last month, how many people would be in the kingdom of God because of your prayer life? And I got up, I went to the office, I shut my door, and I began to weep and pray to the Lord of the harvest because I had realized that is an area in my life that I had neglected. I had been so consumed with family concerns and personal concerns and ministry concerns that I had neglected to consistently and strategically pray to the Lord of the harvest for workers and for the harvest. Now, the reason I share that with you this morning is not so that you go home and are filled with anxiety and fear and legalistically read out loud 1,000 names every morning. Uh, I don't think that's the intention. The other side of it, too, is prayer is not an excuse for us not to live sent. And living sent is not an excuse for us not to pray. Both those things are difficult, and sometimes we choose one over the other, but I wonder what it would look like this morning if we as a church made both of those things not optional, but necessary to living out the mission and message of Jesus. And it's easy though, right? It's easy to get distracted. I don't know where you're at in your season of life, but sometimes I just feel like I'm doing all I can to keep my head above water clinging onto a life raft. And real quickly, I can ignore all those people who are drowning around me. And Jesus has to remind us that he has one main mission. That he's asked us to make disciples that make disciples. And too soon we become distracted, not only by bad things, but sometimes good things and sometimes church things. And we neglect to pray to the Lord of the harvest and go into the Lord of the harvest fields, reaping what he is sowing. So this morning we have a text that is a simple reminder that Jesus had to give his disciples and I think that he wants to give us as well. So we'll be in Matthew chapter nine and if you'll stand with me in the honor of reading God's word. We'll be in Matthew chapter nine. We'll start in verse 35. Then Jesus went to all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. I'll say the word of the Lord if you'll say thanks be to God. The word of the Lord. Pray with me. Jesus, would you go before us in this text and make a way? Holy Spirit, 
Would you give your church eyes to see and ears to hear? Together we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen. I love the progression in this text. Jesus is out on his speaking tour. He pauses to do a breakout session on healing. He's laying his hands on and touching people that apparently a lot of the religious codes and requirements said, oh, no, no, Jesus, we don't do that. He's going out of bounds to those who have been outcast, and he's locking eyes with them. And he is living sent because he is the sent God. The title of the sermon is Following a Sent God, and God sent Jesus, so we are following a sent God. A question you might ask yourself this morning, if I'm not living sent, am I really following a sent God? One of the things I'd love to do for you guys this morning, if you want to jot them down, I'll give you a couple questions. I really like making conversations in the car ride home awkward for you, so I'm going to help facilitate that. Um, you do know, like, if we sit here and listen, your retention rate will probably be about 15%. If you discuss what you've learned, it'll jump to about 60%. Um, so I'll make sure it's short. You just make sure you answer the questions later. Does that sound good? So uh, uh, Jesus, as he's, he's doing all this, it's, it's really interesting that the text points out the fact that he has compassion on the crowds. He literally feels compassion. And I wonder, the question you might ask yourself in the car ride home today is, where does your compassion drive you? Where do you live sent into your compassion? One of the ways that I love asking this question is, what is broken in the world today that breaks your heart? That you experience divine compassion for? And sometimes that doesn't immediately manifests itself as compassion, sometimes the first hint of it is you feel righteous anger. That someone or some people by a form of brokenness have been marginalized and they have been ostracized and they find themselves weary and worn out. And when you see it, it doesn't produce in you, <laughs> you're getting what you deserve. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps, you fix yourself, you made your bed lie in it, but no, a divine compassion from Jesus courses through your heart and your soul and you feel as if I can't sit still, I want to go. And I want to be a healing reminder of Jesus' love. What brokenness in the world today breaks your heart the way that it breaks God's? Maybe that's a clue about where we will find incredible spiritual authority and energy when we choose to live sent. Now, did you notice the motivation for Jesus' compassion? Because he looks at the crowd. First of all, he's locking eyes with them. He's not just driving by. It's not just a section of town he avoids. He's out and about with the people, locking eyes with them. He feels compassion for them because they are weary and worn out. Other translations say distressed and downcast or harassed and helpless. If you're trying to find your source of divine compassion, here's another question I have for you on the car ride home. Where were you and when were you in your story weary and worn out? Where have you found yourself harassed and helpless, distressed and downcast? Where were you when there was a particular situation or brokenness in your life that with every effort you alone could not fix? and it broke your legs, and you could not pick yourself up, and in that moment, you found a Jesus who leaves the 99 and came to the one, who picked you up and put you on his shoulders, and he carried you home, and through the power of his resurrection, his restoration, and his redemption, you found a love, a grace, a mercy, and a power you didn't think was possible for you. I would submit to you that perhaps that's your primary place of service in the harvest fields. That oftentimes our greatest pain leads to our greatest passion. And I wonder, when can we start to become the kind of church that embraces those painful, broken chapters in our lives rather than hiding them? 
Why don't we look at Jesus' example who after the resurrection thrusts out his scars so that his followers can see them and say resurrection is real. Why are we always clenching our fists and hiding our scars? We know that the power of Christ is made perfect in our weakness. So church, why don't we start boasting all the more gladly about our weaknesses for when we are weak, he is made strong. Then maybe we would start to see some power and authority in the harvest. I don't know about you, but some of the men and women in my life who have been spiritual mothers and fathers to me are not the one who hid their scars from me. They're the ones that stretched them out and said, I want to show you the healing power of Jesus. So he has compassion on them because they are weary and they are worn out. And he turns to his disciples and says, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might send out workers. Curious that that's part of his primary strategy to accomplish making disciples that make disciples is prayer. Curious that he knows even his own followers and the complacencies in the hearts of men and women are always to drift away from the main mission. Curious that right after this text, he will actually send them out. So some of them just became the answer to their own prayer requests. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. It's so easy to forget and neglect though, isn't it? It's so easy without us even realizing it, that our comfort and convenience become our main means of worship rather than prayer and service. Uh, Last Tuesday night, um, we were, uh, it wasn't last Tuesday, it was three Tuesdays ago, potato, potato. It happened, I promise. (laughs) We, We were getting ready to do a communion service at Kairos. And Kairos, it, I'm so honored to be a part of that team and those people in that place. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, thank you for letting me be there. And the, the music, the worship, the pastors, the ministers who all make up a worship team, incredible. Like, it, it's unbelievable. But every month we try to take the Lord's Supper together and we intentionally scale those nights down. Now, I know you guys aren't in danger of this, but I just need to make sure the next generation doesn't worship worship or a particular style of worship. Again, you guys aren't in danger of that. I know you're more mature than that. Um, <laughs> so we pull all the instrumentation back and it is a simple setup on the floor and we have to remind ourselves that the main voice and musical, main instrument in musical worship was always designed to be the congregation's voice. And so we let them find their voice and it's, it's a different night. It's not usually what people expect. And then communion becomes the centerpiece um, and it is reflective, uh, it is confrontational, it is repentive. Uh, it's all these wonderful things where we get to actually encounter the Lord in and through the sacraments. And I'm praying over the room before the service is gonna start. And uh, part of my habit is to pray certain things in scriptures over the room. I'm in the center of the back room and I'm, I'm praying over the room and I said, Jesus, would you let salvation spring up from the ground tonight? And the very next thought in my brain was, it's just a communion service. No one's coming to Christ. It's not super seeker sensitive. Your sermon's not real funny. Um, it's not really, it's just a healing reminder to take your time with Jesus. And I had to rebuke myself out loud. Did anybody else rebuke yourself out loud? Maybe that's just my sinner's problem. Um, I, I just said, oh no. And uh, so I started praying out loud, Jesus, salvation, spring up from the ground. Please bring men and women to you. Come seek and save that which is lost. You know, just trying to leverage my faith even in the midst of my suspicions and doubt. So we get done the service. It was, it was beautiful service. And afterwards, um, a guy just comes walking straight towards me. Usually, I don't know, from a preacher's perspective, you usually get people who walk around or who kind of stand like this or kind of meander because you're not really human and people don't know how to approach you afterwards. But he's like straight for me and I'm like, oh boy, here it comes. Um, uh, I, Hi, he's like, I need to talk to you in private. I said, okay. So we start going this way and I start preparing. It's one of two things. He's either gonna confess 
a whole pile of sin, which I'm not afraid of sinners or sin. I actually like getting in the dirt of people's life, but I'm practicing, hey, Chris, keep the straight face. No matter what he says, don't look shocked or horrified. Pastoral presence, okay? Bring the peace of Jesus. (laughs) Or with how determined he is, he's about to give me a pile of criticism. Uh, and I, uh, that's, I'm like, okay, your identity's not in your preaching. Don't get defensive. You know, just, just listen. And then when he's done talking, just say, I'll prayerfully consider all that you have told me, okay? <laughs> and then go home and tell your wife why you deserve to be pitied. <laughs> so we get to a spot, and I said, what's up, man? He says, I want to get saved and baptized. You know what I said? Huh? What did you say? I heard exactly what he said. And here I am doing it again. Huh? What did you say? I want to get saved and baptized. Fantastic. I, it was hard for me not just to jump up and hug him, and, <laughs> uh, which probably would not be an appropriate ministerial response. But we walked through it. We just walked through that decision and his story and what was going on. And I just felt like riding home that night, the Lord reminded me. Pray to the Lord of the harvest, Chris. The harvest is plenty. The workers are few. And I could take the next five minutes and tell you story after story about how we've been seeing God move and raise up workers and show us that the harvest is plenty. But if I did that, I'd run the risk of preaching a text and then making obedience optional. So I wonder if I can't try something different and see if you guys can help me do the conclusion to this sermon. Why don't we take the next five minutes and pray to the Lord of the harvest? Not just preach it, not just think about it, not just consider it. What would it look like if we were the kind of church that consistently prays to the Lord of the harvest for workers and to send them out? and for his harvest and for eyes to see and ears to hear. So if that's agreeable with you, even if it's not, I'm probably going to go ahead with it. (laughs) I'll ask Luke to come out, and I'll just guide us through a couple prayer prompts. The altars will be open if you want to come down here and pray. But I just want us to be an extended family that never lose heart for making disciples that make disciples and passionately praise to the Lord of the harvest. I think some of us are quite comfortable with the Lord of our salvation. My question is, do you know the Lord of the harvest? So if you would pray with me. First off, I'd love for you guys just to thank by name, who is the worker God sent to you? Who found you when you were weary and worn out? Who did God use in your life? to help your story, to help you discover who God intended you to be. A friend, a parent, church worker, a missionary, remember those people and thank God that they were sent out into the harvest. Now take a minute and pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. And I'd even challenge you to pray for some people by name. I was talking to a friend of mine recently who served in the mission field overseas and is now back home serving. And when he was telling me his story about how God called him into the harvest, he went to tell his dad and was kind of nervous about it and said, after I told him, I rarely see my father cry. But he told me for the past year, he had been praying that one of his sons would be a pastor and one would be a missionary. And then his dad told him, I didn't think it would be you. (laughs) Hey, parents, pray that the Lord sends your children out to the harvest. 
It's one thing for me to bless my kids at night and pray for their safety and their salvation. It's another thing when I look at them and say, Lord, send them out into the harvest. Grandparents, pray over your family that the Lord sends them into the harvest. If you're here with your parents, pray that the Lord sends your parents to the harvest. Now would you pray for someone by name that you know is outside of Christ's love right now that you would love to see the Lord save, redeem, and resurrect into a life lived fully in the kingdom of God. By name, pray for someone you want to see Jesus rescue. Last one is a listening prayer. Ask the Lord this, how might I be the answer to the prayer I just prayed? How might you be sending me this week to declare and demonstrate the good news of the kingdom of God?